This is the coming revolution in higher consciousness. Listen now to Elizabeth Clare Prophet, educator, author, and authority on the most exciting story of our time, the coming revolution in higher consciousness. These masters that I would speak to you of are called the Lords of the Seven Rays. And I have told their story in a pocketbook, which is by that very name, Lords of the Seven Rays. It's two books in one. The first half gives biographical background. Who were they? When did they live? What did they learn? What did they bring forth? The second half is their teaching. This book emphasizes the fact that there are retreats of these Lords of the Seven Rays, whom we call Ascended Masters, and that these Ascended Masters have opened their retreats as universities of the Spirit. The Ascended Masters teach us, through the Keepers of the Flame lessons, sponsored by Saint Germain, how we can, as we go to sleep at night, pursue meditation, visualization, prayers, and decrees, that we might enter the etheric body, our souls journeying in the etheric body to the etheric plane where these retreats are. Now the universities of the spirit of these seven lords officially opened to vast numbers of people, in fact tens of thousands of people, that would journey there at night on January 1, 1986. There is no question in my mind that all seekers in the new age or a vast percentage of them have at one time or another been taken by angels of light to these inner retreats and that because of an inner learning process that has begun to percolate into the outer mind whether through questioning or through seeking or dissatisfaction with one's current state of awareness there has come about a sense of pursuing a path and arriving at the place when the full awareness should come to you of what you have been learning on these inner planes of being even while you're functioning on this plane. So the basis of that teaching that you learn at inner levels is the basis that I've given you this evening. That is the, the cornerstone of your life, your purpose, your goal, and your destiny in this life. This book then is exciting, easy reading, and it's very heavily illustrated. When I tell you about the Lords of the Seven Rays now, and I talk to you about their embodiments, the slides you see are just a few of the hundreds of illustrations that there are in this book. So we begin with beloved El Moria, known as the Lord of the First Ray. He may look fierce, but he's fiercely devoted to the will of God because the First Ray is the Ray of God's will. That devotion to the will of God shines in him in these following embodiments when any one of you may have known him and walked with him. The first we record is Abraham, 2100 BC. Scholars assume that Abraham was either a humble nomad or a mythical figure, but archeological evidence now confirms the biblical portrait of a wealthy military chieftain. He lived in Sumer, came out of Ur of the Chaldees in obedience to the call of the Lord. El Moria was embodied as Melchior, one of the three wise men. They used a science of the stars, of astrology, to follow not only the place where Jesus was born, but the year and the hour of his birth. He was Arthur, king of the Britons in the fourth or fifth century. Until recently, Arthur has been assumed to be legendary, but today both archaeological and literary investigations reveal a 4th or 5th century leader who conforms to the profile of King Arthur. He used Roman military tactics and lived in Scotland. 
There are also locations that say that Camelot uh, was in England, uh, not too far from Glastonbury. El Moria was embodied as St. Thomas Becket. 1118 to 1170, he was Lord Chancellor of England, friend and advisor to King Henry II. He became Archbishop of Canterbury. He came into conflict with the king over the rights of the church. And shortly following Christmas, on December 29, 1170, he was murdered in Canterbury Cathedral by four knights who took literally Henry's remark that he wished to be rid of this turbulent priest. The tremendous bravery and courage with which he went to that altar knowing that these men were pursuing him is just one more life's example of the dedication of his soul to be the embodiment of the will of God. The strength and the courage of beloved El Moria, even in the embodiments I have thus far named, is a guiding light to all who know him and feel the presence of his love. El Moria is the master who called me when I was a student at Boston University. He appeared to me. He was the first master I had ever seen with my own inner eye, with the exception of Saint Germain, who had come to me when I was 18. He was there in full presence, powerfully radiating his aura, and said, I have need of a feminine messenger, go to Washington to be trained under Mark Prophet. That was his message. Having so delivered it, he moved on. Moria is very straightforward, very direct, and very much active in the affairs of state in the world today, as he was in his embodiment as St. Thomas More, 1478 to 1535, Lord Chancellor of England. He was lawyer, judge, statesman, author, poet, and humanist. All of those callings reflect the first ray. Now these rays of God are seven ways that you can attain personal Christhood, putting on the light of God through the works of one of these seven rays or seven planes of being. Again, he comes in conflict with Henry, this time Henry VIII, for refusing to take the oath of supremacy which implied the rejection of papal authority and made Henry the head of the English church. He was convicted of treason on perjured evidence and beheaded. Good-naturedly, he actually gave a gold coin to the one who held the ax, and he said that he died the king's good servant, but God's first. At any time, he could have complied with the king's request and compromised his soul. The interesting thing about these two incarnations of El Moria is that Henry II and Henry VIII were also the same individual and the same one who had him put to death. So we discover as we read the Lords of the Seven Rays the ties lifetime to lifetime in these seven masters and we realize that we also have many ties many interesting relationships that are carryovers from previous lifetimes. And as I said before, in this age of reckoning, we go through many situations and relationships, but always the purpose being to release the light of God, the Holy Spirit, for balance, for blessing, for resolution, for love, whereby we can go in peace and not be bound by age-old wounds, hurts, angers, sorrows, prejudices, fears, and envies. We find Moria as Akbar, 1542 to 1605, the greatest of the Mughal emperors of India. He has been described as one of the few successful examples of Plato's philosopher king. He actually founded his own faith, a divine monotheism that united the, ba the basic truths of all religions. He had representatives of all the world's major religions coming to him. He was supremely tolerant he allowed all to practice their religion in his realm. He put the best of them all together, hoping the people would broaden their horizons. But in the end, only his closest servants and friends adopted it. But his legacy of universality, religious tolerance, and a well-organized government blessed India for centuries. 
El Moria concluded his incarnations in the West as the famous Irish poet Thomas More, composer, musician, prolific writer of prose and poetry. Following that life, he went to India, became the Rajput Prince El Moria Khan, and took his ascension in 1898. Do you realize that before a century passes, you could also attain to reunion with God through the ascension in the light? And that, in fact, that may very well be your destiny in this life, the one to which you are called, to balance your karma, serve the will of God, love all life free, and return to his heart never more to go out in the round and wheel of rebirth. The conclusion of the Piscean Age is a great harvest. Jesus talks about that. There's a great harvest of the seed of Christ who are intended to come home. And there is also a harvest of the tares, the seed of the evil one sown among the seed, the good seed. El Moria then teaches us the mastery of the throat chakra. It is the blue chakra that you see at the throat. It has 16 petals. The chakras start out with a few petals, four at the base of the spine, uh, the thousand petal lotus at the crown. This means that each chakra has a different vibration or frequency. You have seven chakras to experience God in seven different ways. I'd like to show you the chakra man in the violet flame again so that I can talk to you about how you are already experiencing God, but you've just not thought about your daily life in that sense of the word. First of all, you can see the crown chakra. It's a golden yellow. And that is where the mind of God that was in Christ Jesus is anchored in you through the physical brain and nervous system. When you are thinking, you are sensing yourself centered somewhere at the top of your head. Most of us feel that when we are studying, that's where we're centered. Then you come to the third eye chakra right at the brow. This is the point of concentration. And so when you concentrate, you usually wrinkle up your brow and you're kind of looking like this, very intent on what you are seeing or watching. Through that third eye, you see good and evil and you embody your choice. So that is the third eye chakra and that is where you experience God as concentration. Then you come to the throat chakra, which is the power center, and here you experience God as the power of the spoken word, and you observe every day how your words may comfort people, curse people, lift them up, put them down. Uh, people use power in good ways and bad ways, but usually their conversation is involved. Politicians make speeches, etc., etc. Then you go to the heart, it's the pink chakra, 12 petals, and here you experience God as love. When you love someone or love God or love an animal or nature, you feel the love of your heart expand. You really feel a love going forth from you, and it does feel pink. Then when you go to the solar plexus chakra below the heart, which has 10 petals, you are involved in the focus of the desire body. So our desirings, ordinate and inordinate, we experience. The desire for food is experienced in this chakra, the desire for money, the desire for conquest, all kinds of things. But the solar plexus is the place of peace. And that solar plexus, the place of the sun, is where we establish peace in meditation and in prayer. The antithesis of peace is turbulence, anger, violence, butterflies in the belly. So there's an extreme of emotions that we feel in that particular center. Again, we choose the part of God we want to experience, hopefully the highest. The next chakra going down is the seat of the soul. It's the violet chakra. The previous one was the purple and gold. The violet chakra is the point where your soul is anchored. When you feel so yourself below the heart, it feels like your subconscious. When you talk about your subconscious, it's the place that is below your awareness. The soul then knows, but it knows at another level of consciousness. The soul warns you, it gets a gut feeling, 
You have a sense of danger, it comes from that chakra. You have a sense of danger communicated by angels, it's communicated through the soul. So this chakra, this chakra can be activated as you develop the senses of the soul or the psyche, which are called psychic senses because they relate to the soul's awareness. Finally, the base chakra, which is the white chakra, the farthest descent of light in our temples, the seat of the Divine Mother, the place of purity, is the seat of the life force. That life force is intended to be raised up through the chakras at all levels for our daily creativity in our professions and in our lives. It is also the power by which we procreate. So now you can see that all of your life you actually have been experiencing God in seven planes of being. And you have actually been qualifying the light of God in those planes. Because the light comes down to you over that crystal cord, and that comes from your I Am Presence. The light enters that soft spot in the top of the head you can see at the birth of a child, and it goes to your central sun of being, the distributing center, which is your heart chakra. At the point of entrance into your world, that crystal clear stream, which is without vibration except the pure balance of Alpha and Omega, begins to take on coloration. Your feelings, your thoughts, your speech, your motives, your intents. And so that light is released through any one of the seven chakras, for good or for ill. If it is used to glorify God, as you work and serve, if you love to work for the sake of work, for the sake of the excellence, for the sake of per perfecting an art, then you find that that is a means to the path of personal Christhood, which you pursue as a disciple of Jesus Christ and the other teachers, the servant sons in heaven who are the ascended masters, such as these seven I'm speaking about. So what happens to the light that you send forth? If it has a good vibration, it ascends back to your causal body and it goes to the very ring of light or sphere of light that corresponds to the chakra. So if you send forth love, love goes into the pink sphere that is above. And if we look at that sphere, you can see those rings, or we can look at the whole chart. If you use your throat chakra to amplify a right vibration, truth, your speech is for the edification and upliftment of people, it will increase the blue sphere. If you use the third eye, the green, that third eye chakra is for science, healing, music, vision. And therefore, if you are a scientist or physician and have been for many lifetimes, your good qualified energy has gone to the green sphere and you have a very large green sphere. It will be much larger than your other spheres. The purple and gold is the next one in that comes from the solar plexus. It's if you are a person of great peace and send forth waves of peace and walk in the footsteps of Jesus, that's essentially the Piscean path, uh, that ring will be large. It's a path of service and ministration. People who love to take care of other people have a big purple and gold sphere in their causal body. Next comes the violet flame. That's the seat of the soul chakra. And that is the one where we amplify Freedom, mercy, justice, science, alchemy, uh, the Aquarian age, diplomacy, uh, divine ritual. Then comes the pink, which is the heart, the yellow, which is the crown, and the white, the base of the spine. So now we realize that we all began with a causal body of equal dimension. But with our twin flame in the beginning, we made a determination that we would major on one of these rays, and we would go forth into the cosmos to glorify God in the virtues of one of these paths. So this is what you did in the beginning and what you are today is no doubt reflected in one of these paths. As you read the stories and lifetimes of the seven Chohans, you'll feel yourself gravitating toward one, be more interested in one because that is your ray. And so if somebody asks you, what ray are you on? You'll know they're asking you, what is the ray of your service and your self mastery in this life? What is your chosen calling? So it is your free will in what profession or field that you are going to glorify Christ in your members, in your body. Lords of the Seven Rays is a book on the mystical body of Christ. It says in scripture, one star differeth from another in glory, so is the resurrection of the dead. The star is your causal body. 
everyone in this room has a different causal body and we can all bask in the light of and rejoice in the achievements and accomplishments of one another. This is a very exciting understanding that we have. Now if we send forth through those seven chakras a negative energy and a negative vibration, that is like unbalanced energy. It has weight and it stays here below with us and it becomes karma. Causes we have set in motion that are effects today in our world that we have to deal with. So you can think of all the kinds of negatives that anyone can express within his being and you can understand that we're carrying around karma of the last 2,000 years and of many ages before. Saint Germain comes with a violet flame to teach us the transmutation of that karma. So in just a moment, I'll begin to show you how to invoke that violet flame. So getting back to El Moria, the throat chakra and the 16 petals, we discover that El Moria's retreat and his university of the spirit is in Darjeeling, India, in the etheric octave. The etheric octave is really more concrete when you are there than the physical. Amazingly so, but this world is very transient, very temporal, very subject to decay. The etheric plane is the reality of which this world is an imperfect manifestation. So were you to journey there at night, you would see a temple, you would see a magnificent a temple that is described in the book. You would be taken into the chambers and taught by El Moria himself or one of the teachers who teach with him. So if it is to Darjeeling you would go, you would keep a photograph of these mountains, Kachinjunga, uh, and you would look at that before you go to sleep. Then you would ask angels of Archangel Michael to take you there and to go there in your finer bodies. Now the lords of the seven rays give us a teaching and that teaching is to help us to receive gifts of the Holy Spirit. El Moria tutors our souls to be prepared to receive faith in God's will and the word of wisdom. Paul talks about these gifts of the Holy Spirit, nine in number. It's very important that we pursue the perfecting of our souls to receive those gifts. Before I go on with Moria's teaching on gemstones, I would like to invite you to give some violet flame decrees so you can begin to feel the process of the violet flame passing through you. Now the violet flame is a singing flame and so we're going to say number 18 on page five and then we're going to sing it. When you see the word I am that is capitalized you know that you are saying the name of God and you say it with great reverence and you know that it means God in me is, I am, God in me is the violet flame in action in me now. So by free will that God gave you, by the divine spark he placed in your heart as the threefold flame of the Trinity, power, wisdom and love, you are sending forth this light and affirming that you desire that light to be in your temple now as the violet flame because by enlightened choice you know that the violet flame is the most important action you can have in this age because it balances karma and whatever is balanced in you also goes as blessing to your twin flame so you are lightening the load of both of you and furthering your coming together through divine union with God. The violet flame then is a mitigation of personal karma as we give it 15 minutes a day, and you'll find in my book, The Science of the Spoken Word, a section that's called 10 for Transmutation, 10 marvelous violet flame decrees that you can give daily. And 15 minutes is a tremendous lightening of your load. You'll notice it, just give it a try. Just experiment as an alchemist in the laboratory of your being and see how life changes for you when you make one single addition, that is the call to the violet flame. This violet flame now we're going to invoke, visualize it descending from the heart of your I am presence and holy Christ self, and from great reservoirs of violet flame in the universe, and from all masters, angels, and heavenly hosts who have chosen by free will to serve on the seventh ray. And that includes Saint Germain and his twin flame, who is called the goddess of justice, beloved Portia. Violet flame, come into our temples now. Purify us, O God. Set the captives free. Let my people go that they might sacrifice unto thee. 
Therefore, in Jesus' name we say, I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame to light alone I vow. I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like a sun. I am God's sacred power freeing everyone. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame to light alone I vow. I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like a sun. I am God's sacred power freeing everyone. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame to light alone I vow. I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like a sun. I am God's sacred power freeing everyone. Why don't you stand now to sing this? The violet flame is the closest flame to your physical action. It's a flame for sports and exercise. Tapes of these decrees, in fact, for this entire booklet are available. When you do your exercise and you happen to have headsets on and a tape player on your belt, you can actually be reciting mantras that go through your physical pores and cells even as you are engaged in deep breathing from physical exercise, you can qualify that breath as the sacred fire breath and make all physical exercise a spiritual, physical increase of light. to be seated. An ascended master is someone just like you. That individual has gone through Earth's schoolroom, graduated by mastering his karma, his momentums, his desires, his purpose, fulfilling his divine plan, and therefore internalizing the word, the light of Christ and of the I Am Presence and at the conclusion of his lifetime, the soul ascending then to the fullness of that I Am Presence, reunion with God. This path then is one to be looked for, hoped for, and realized by you if you choose it from this day forward. You may have chosen it before you took embodiment. Angels may have already told you that this is your destiny. There is not one saint in heaven who is an ascended master who has not returned to God by a knowledge of the violet flame. It is the spiritual light and quickening that becomes a part of one's aura and awareness as one draws closer and closer to God. 
So now in this Aquarian age dawning, Saint Germain, the Lord of the seventh ray, which is the seventh age of, Aquari of Aquarius, has come to remind us of this violet flame and to give the teaching to the public, to the whole world. It is no longer kept for the inner retreat or private initiation experience because it happens to be the dispensation of the seventh age. So it is a day when the whole world has access to the transmuting, baptizing, sacred fire of the Holy Spirit. Now, one such one who became acquainted with this flame and therefore fulfilled the final balancing of his karma in India, as I mentioned to you, as Al Moria Khan, is the Lord of the First Ray. He uses certain gemstones for the concentration of light as what we would call a molecular chalice. Let us explain the realities and the myths about crystals. Crystals are not good luck charms. Crystals are a molecular chalice. Please remember that term. I'll show you a large rock crystal so you can feel the vibration of it. What is a molecular chalice? All crystals and gemstones have a different composition, a different combination of chemical elements that make up their molecule. They are designed by Elohim and executed by the nature spirits, the gnomes. And they are the laborers in the Father's vineyard. There are gnomes of the earth, sylphs of the air, salamanders of the fire, and undines of the water, to put it in the alchemist terms. So this is a piece of rock crystal, and let's focus on this one for a while. It's actually very large, and it is a chalice that is upon the altar. We also have a chalice of crystal behind this crystal chalice on this one. It's a very large piece of crystal. Now this crystal then has a molecular quality that can hold light, an extraordinary amount of light. Who puts the light there? Well, first of all, the elementals. Secondly, God and the ascended masters may choose to put light in a crystal but you may also choose to put light in a crystal. Our chakras are our real crystals, but we don't have our chakras tuned. We don't have them to the place and frequency that we should have them by the end of the age of Pisces, so we could walk the earth fully focusing that universal Christ consciousness, that Son of God. That power and presence of the Son of God is more than most of us could bear in our bodies. The light is so great that it would nullify or neutralize our identity. So increment by increment and day by day by the mantra, by purifying our bodies and so forth, we are able to be carriers of more light. That's why we are called by the Ascended Masters the light bearers of the world, because we have made it our goal daily to bear the light in our chakras. Well, we need more light, we need access to it, and we need focuses of light upon our altar and in our households to seal where we live and move from the tremendous weight of karma in the world. So that's why we want crystals. But we don't attribute to them superstitiously powers of their own. They are tools that God has provided us in nature. Now this crystal has a presence, as you can tell and feel, and it is quite a powerful one. I'll take a crystal from the altar at this time and show you how you would charge this crystal. The left hand is the hand through which the omega current flows through your I am presence. The right hand is the alpha current. Now we are taught to charge our food in this manner or a glass of water. You can call for the light of alpha and omega to charge any substance. What is important to realize is that I, of mine own self, can do nothing. It is the Father in me who doeth the work. A crystal is charged in the name of my beloved I am presence and holy Christ self by the authority of the threefold flame in my heart. When you so charge matter by that authority, the all power of God descends. So, breathing upon crystals or wishing or willing upon them is not quite where it is. What you need to do is access the light of the spirit cosmos because matter is a bowl. 
It's a bush. Without the flame of spirit, that bush isn't going to be burning, and this crystal is not going to be fired. Now, we assume that because crystals grow in the earth, that their vibrations are perfect. But the planet is seething with eons of negative karma. Crystals are not exempt. So before a crystal is charged, it has to be demagnetized. I don't know who's handled this crystal. It recently came from the mines. It's changed hands. So, being a manifestation of the Son of God, or a daughter of God, a Son of God, as you would put it, I exercise my free will and my endowment of being a co-creator with God. So it is my desiring that this crystal should be a chalice for the pure white light of the Divine Mother upon the altar, and that it might hold that light for all who would need it. Then I ask that my daily recitations of my mantras to the Mother, of my Hail Mary, the light I call forth thereby, not only quicken my soul and being in my body, but shall be deposited at the molecular level in this crystal, shall, shall accumulate. Now this crystal is capable of holding a tremendous amount of light. That's why we use them. So first demagnetize, then call to God to set the matrix, seal your call according to his will, accept it done, and put this on your altar where you meditate, and each time you pray and decree, it will increase in it. Your idea is to build a momentum of light in your temple and in the crystal focus on the altar. So this is how we begin first the demagnetization. In the name of the living God, I am that I am. In the name of Jesus Christ, my own beloved Holy Christ self, I call now upon the great central sun magnet. Demagnetize this piece of crystal of all vibrations less than the universal Christ consciousness. Demagnetize it now of the karma of planet Earth, of all human consciousness, of anyone who has used it or handled it. Let it be demagnetized now by the power of my mighty I Am Presence, by the Alpha, the Omega. I call now for the balancing of this crystal in the Alpha Omega divine polarity. I call now in the name of my mighty I Am Presence and Holy Christ Self by the power of the great central sun magnet and the Divine Mother. I call to the heart of Mother Mary. I call to the heart of Kuan Yin and the White Goddess. I call now to the Divine Mother and the light within me. Charge and charge and charge in the name I am that I am, this crystal, as a receptacle of the light of the Universal Mother. Let it be done according to God's will, according to the master alchemist, Saint Germain. So let it be sealed. Let this crystal therefore forever be a vessel of the light of the, the Divine Mother for all who look upon it and need a charge of healing. I accept it done this hour in full power. Amen. So I would consecrate my chakras, for they are also crystals. You are intended to be a crystallization of the God flame of your I Am Presence, the Christ realization here below of your I Am Presence, the crystallization of the God flame. The most precious crystal in the whole cosmos is you, the individuality in God, putting on and becoming your own Christhood. That is the real crystal. So these are our tools these gemstones. The high priest of Israel wore a breastplate of 12 gemstones, each one marking the sign of the path of initiation of each of the 12 tribes under the 12 signs of the zodiac. Now, as you determine the ray of your service, 
that is the gemstone or crystal that you would like to acquire so that it can be used to step up and tune the chakra of the ray of your service and potential Christhood. So that is why we are going to review them. The first ray person is like El Moria. So go to Lords of the Seven Rays, read his embodiments. In part two of the book, you'll read his dictation. It's the ray of statesmen, people who are organizers, who are administrators, lawyers, economists, just plain people at any level of life who always emerge as leaders. They become the captain of the team. They're the person that everybody tends to follow. They're usually very vocal, and they're the first person that speaks and has ideas and says, let's do this, and then figures out how to do it. Practical people. They say that one in every seven people is such an, an organizer or a leader, or where you have a crowd, one-seventh of the people will emerge as the nucleus to give direction. So divine direction is a quality of the first ray, as well as protection and perfection. You are a person who wants excellence, and you strive for excellence in all you do. Now, you may be serving on another ray and have those qualities, but those are the qualities, and without the first ray, we can't master the other seven, because the first ray, the blue ray, is the blueprint of identity. It's the matrix. You have to have an architectural drawing if you're going to build. And we are builders in this age. The great leaders of all time and the great heroes have been first-ray people, but they would never would have made it without the support team of those serving on the other rays. So I will explain them to you now, beginning with the diamond. The diamond is the first stone that is used by the Lord of the First Ray, but it is also used by the Lords of all of the rays. It comes down to us with a tradition of embodying the power of God. It is actually the highest vibrating crystal. All gems are crystal. In fact, all matter is crystal. The diamond is associated with kingship, priesthood, and power. In Sanskrit, it is called Vajra, which means thunderbolt. It has been called adamant, which stems from the Greek word adamus, signifying the unconquerable. In ancient times, the diamond was said to endow the wearer with superior strength, fortitude, and courage, to strengthen body and mind, induce purity and fearlessness, and defend against enemies. Edgar Cayce, in his readings, talked much about gems, and he said the diamond was good for attunement with infinity. It is definitely the focus of God's will and assists us in carrying the power and the alignment and balance of the Alpha Omega, Father, Mother, God, centered in this throat chakra. We speak of the diamond heart of Mary as the diamond heart of her devotion to the will of God. The lapis lazuli was believed to protect, strengthen, and counteract dark spirits. I have experimented with both the diamond and the lapis, and uh, I find the diamond to be exactly what it says it is. It does help you focus the power of God and strength uh, to fulfill your mission. It is a great protection also. With the lapis, you find it at a different level of vibration. It is a lower level of vibration, but it gives that strengthening and healing presence. When you wear a chain of lapis on your body, directly on your skin, and you can wear these things at night uh, as well as in the daytime, you will notice that there is a bringing together and an aligning of your inner forces in balance. Lapis has been seen as the emblem of chastity. Edgar Cayce recommended it for general health, strengthening self-assurance, again, attunement to infinity. There was a Sumerian belief that the wearer of a lapis amulet carries with him the presence of a god, we would say, of an ascended master or a saint. The lapis helps to align the soul with its original blueprint that we went forth with from the central sun. Then there is the sapphire that is also used on the first ray. The Buddhists say it produces a desire for prayer, gives spiritual light, brings peace and happiness, as long as its wearer leads a moral life. 
That is because it embodies the law of God, which is the first ray, and that law demands of us that we serve it, and then it will turn and serve us. It calms the mind, gives awareness of cosmic realms, strengthens the will. The star sapphire is a focus of one's causal body. It is believed that star sapphires defend against evil eye and witchcraft. The focus of the sapphire itself as a protection throughout trials and temptations of life, I believe to be indispensable to those who serve with Archangel Michael. And I have seen that the sapphire attracts the rays of Sirius. Now you have noticed that I am wearing rings on each of my fingers, and I will explain this to you because it is an assignment from Saint Germain. These are not adornments, but they are tools or focuses of light. As we have shown you the seven chakras and the seven rays, so I would explain to you that your hands have chakras and they are in the very center of the palm. These are five secret rays and in these five points of his body, Jesus was also uh, marked in the crucifixion. The feet, the hands, and the side, which signifies the spleen. So the five secret rays then are actually individually released through the hands, through the fingers. Now when you extend your hands in this way, you are cupping them to receive the light of God. When you put them this way, you are sending out light. But that light is alpha, giving the light of your I am presence, and omega, plus, minus, father and mother. It is with this hand that you receive and this hand that you give, but you can bless with both hands. So some of you engaged in the healing arts, when you may work on patience, know then that you can receive directly through your I am presence light to pass into the body of those who need realignment in whatever way or whatever branch of healing you may be involved in. So these particular focuses that I have were directed uh, to me by Saint Germain. Uh, I, of course, have had no desire to own them. They are the property of the church, uh, church universal and triumphant. And they are definitely, as I see them, uh, the instruments whereby I do my work and one of the things that I do is to hold healing services with the laying on of hands on individuals. And again, I am not a healer, but God is, and the masters will use these focuses to transmit a very special light. El Moria's message then, if I could take a single paragraph from the Book of Lords uh, for you, is that he says, beloved hearts of light, you see that the return to discipleship is necessary, for a people have forgotten their God. They have not understood the true coming of Jesus, and therefore they do not understand why the saints have lived, why they have sacrificed, why they have left a record. Because the emphasis is not on you, but upon Christ nailed to a cross. This will afford you nothing unless you yourself realize that all that was in this Son of God can be yours. We come then to the Lord of the second ray, Lord Lanto. This is a slide of the Duke of Zhou, thought by some to be an embodiment of Lord Lanto. He volunteered with the Ancient of Days to come to Earth long ago for the rescue of the planet and her evolutions. At that time, a great retreat was built known as Shambhala. Shambhala has come down to us in the centuries as a fabled, legendary place. It was actually a great shrine of light. It existed in an island in the midst of the Gobi Sea where the Gobi Desert now is. Lanto was a high priest in the Temple of the Divine Mother on the continent that sank beneath the Pacific known as Lemuria. He had other incarnations on Atlantis, as all of these lords did. Following the sinking of Mu and Atlantis, a number of these masters bore the flames that they tended in their retreats there to other landed areas. New physical temples were built, and finally, at a certain period when mankind became so destructive, these temples were drawn up into the etheric octave. Lanto then bore the flame of precipitation. It is a Chinese green tinged in gold, and that flame exists today in a chamber of the Royal Teton Retreat, 
concurrent with the Grand Teton Mountains. You can go there and see that flame in your finer body. You can meditate with it and learn the precipitation into matter. Now this Grand Teton retreat is for the people of the West to take the light out of the East of spirit and to materialize it in form. So we know that we have become to some extent adept at this in our material civilization between our science and applied technology and all of the things that we have invented. That is part of the restoration of the great heights of civilization to which Lemuria had been taken. In the days of Lemuria, they were far more advanced, however, as they were in Atlantis having spacecraft and uh, all kinds of abilities to manipulate energy, which were used and misused to the destruction and eventual cataclysm of both continents. Lord Lanto held this golden flame of illumination on behalf of the Chinese people for many, many centuries. The golden flame is anchored there in the retreat of archangels. It is such an intense flame, and the people of this land have so been so devoted to it that they are actually called the yellow race. Lord Lanto determined that before his ascension, the light of God in his heart should be actually seen in his flesh as a living proof to his disciples that they all have a divine spark. That is exactly what he did. You remember the words of Job, yet in my flesh shall I see God. That was a decree of Job which he also realized. You can realize it also, and I'd like to show you how and take you for a moment to page 20 of this mantra booklet so that you can give praise and adoration to the flame of God in your heart. It comes from your Holy Christ self, so it's called your Holy Christ flame. Whenever I begin to speak about this flame, I witness to you that the flame in my heart begins to burn with a sensation of a physical fire. I want you to know that apart from seeing the great central sun, the awareness of, fi of a fire in my heart Burning and expanding is the greatest testimony of our God with us. I commend you to the violet flame to clear the heart chakra so that you may also have this profound and sacred experience of this vibration, which I'm feeling at this moment as I place my attention on the sacred heart of Jesus. And I'll offer this prayer for you before we sing number 74. Lord God Almighty, beloved Jesus, the Christ, Ascended hosts of light, saints robed in white, beloved masters who serve with our Lord, archangels, our beloved Father, quicken the divine spark, expand the threefold flame in these hearts. Let them know thee as the incarnate word and sacred fire burning on the altar of the heart that the soul might attain reunion with God. I thank thee, O Lord, for thy presence with us always, and I accept the answer to my call in full power and in full faith here and now.
mantras and songs and decrees for just this celebration of the sacred fire burning on the altar of your heart. In fact, if you would like to know the definition of Christhood in any age and the definition of attainment, it is the quality of the heart and the expanded threefold flame. To increase the light of the heart is to increase enlightenment, grace, power, wisdom, and love. As this fire increases through the adoration to God, so your awareness of Christ in your temple increases. The threefold flame is the expression of your Christ self. You've been watching The Coming Revolution in Higher Consciousness with Elizabeth Clare Prophet. The preceding public access program has been presented through the assistance of Church Universal and Triumphant. Box A, Livingston, Montana. 59047-1390. If you would like to know more, call this number or write this address.